Alright, anything you say around this area will be heard. Questions. Was it live right now? It is live right now. They can hear us. <laughs> Hello, hello guys. Hi. service this morning. <laughs> I did not quite expect our uh, encouragement to uh, watch from home in those kind of numbers today, but even though we're just a few here today, I want to welcome you and also all those watching at home. I want to first uh, give us the verse for this Sunday and this coming week as we have the first of Advent today. It's taken from Luke 21, verse 28, where Jesus says, Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is near. Uh, some of you have already received the email or seen it on Facebook, the announcement that we have some new uh, restrictions from the government. So uh, for the next few weeks, we'll be making sure that we only have one third of our capacity here uh, in in the sanctuary and uh, in addition to all the things that we've been practicing already uh, we want to continue to leave uh, through the back door after the service also we want to make sure that uh, we leave immediately after the service and do not congregate outside in numbers greater than 10 or within six feet of one another um, those of you who are part of small groups, you already have heard that we will only continue with the ones that are here at church, those small groups and home-based Bible studies that uh, otherwise meet, they are encouraged to uh, meet over the internet where possible. Also, uh, a couple of members of the worship team have agreed uh, to lead us in singing, as that is still allowed, but they'll be singing for us with masks on in the second service. And uh, we will still continue to hum along or think uh, quietly as the words will be up behind us, uh, at least for now. And uh, yeah, one more thing I wanted to uh, point out is someone, I think it was Monica, prepared some Advent cookies for us that are in the brown bags here uh, right beside the altar. So when you leave, don't forget to pick one up for yourself. Right now, I encourage you to sing along at home or hum along here as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. <laughs> Long the exile here 
and also within us, continually taking us by the hand and giving us uh, the, the view of something much more glorious to come. Thank you, Father, for our missionaries that continue to serve faithfully in so many countries. Lord, they're dealing with the same thing that we are here. And so we pray, Father, that they'll be able to minister uh, to their often small congregations. And I pray, Father, that they will not be discouraged, but continue to see signs of hope and new life springing up. We pray that you may shield them from all the attacks of the evil one and that you will also bless their families. And so we thank you now, Lord, for this time that we have here this morning. May you bless us richly again. For this in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The scripture reading this morning, I want to read from the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, uh, verses 9 and 10. And here's what it says. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To God. I want to sing another hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Sunday. Uh, it won't just be me up here this morning, but later on also Pastor Jesse and then Pastor Calvin. Each of us will uh, give a little short contribution from our own perspective of what that means, living the story. I want to uh, first of all point out that even though we've used that word story so much, uh, we don't want to walk away with the impression that story is something, something fictional. I mean, when we've been told stories as children or even as adults are reading novels and things 
of that nature, you know, that may very easily come across that this is something unreal or, you know, something different from what is happening. No, we simply wanted to point out that the very lives we live, the very world we live on is part of a story. We need to realize that we ourselves are not a coincidence and that life does not happen randomly. The amazing thing, um, you know, when I look at the way the Bible portrays the story unfolding and, you know, taking its twists and turns is that on the one hand, the parameters are set. There is a creator. There is an origin of why things here are present at all. There is also a, a story moving towards a, a very definite future. This is not completely open. No one knows what's going to happen. Oh no, but God knows already from the beginning how the story will unfold. And that in itself gives us a lot of confidence because you know, no matter how hard things may be at times and how we ourselves may feel like, what's next? And, and we can get fearful and, and anxious, but we already know that uh, God knows how these things are going to end and that he will bring it to his definite and glorious goal. And that's a great comfort in itself. But the other aspect of that, even though the parameters are set, we are not mere actors acting out of script. We're not puppets, you know, strung along on strings and, you know, however the puppet master moves the puppet around, that's what the puppet says or does. We're also not robots just acting out what we've been pre-programmed to do. God does not tightly control every step we take or micromanage as we see this already in the opening story of the Bible where God puts the first people into this beautiful, amazing garden full of all kinds of trees. And the predominant theme there is this is all for you. You, know, you can pick from this amazing number and variety and God is not there every step of the way and says, oh, no, you need to eat, you know, this fruit now. And today, this is on the menu. No, they, they can pick themselves, except for that one that would do them harm. So there's a lot of permission, and yet we're sometimes so easily deceived to really see something sinister behind the very thing that God put in place. And Jesse talked about some of those aspects uh, last Sunday when he uh, gave us the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness that sort of reenacts uh, once again the original temptation of the first people. And uh, the lure, if you will, behind the temptation is always, you know, maybe what you find here is not what you were told to believe. You know, the sowing of distrust. And, and maybe there is something even better that you should try out. In the New Testament, in the book of Romans, we have Paul referring to how even after creation, the testimony of creation itself remained, and so that in itself was, you know, always a, a very definite way of people being able to know why they're here and what kind of a God they're dealing with. I want to quickly read this morning from Romans 1, verses 20 to 23. Here Paul says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look 
like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. So once again, people had all the evidence they needed that they were created, that they were surrounded by a beautiful creation which pointed to an ingenious and glorious God. And yet what kind of image do people hold on to? It's something they, in the end, create themselves. And they take created things and they uh, turn them into idols. And so instead of worshiping the creator, they start worshiping the creation itself or, you know, some kind of rep representation of what they believe God is like. And that's not only a futile endeavor, it's also exactly contrary to what that evidence normally should lead us to. And I think that's so amazing here that those two things are particularly pointed out and we can sort of turn them around and turn them into something positive when you think about what the story the way god has set it up is actually wanting to lead us into just let me uh read one more time from verse 21 for although they knew god they neither glorified him as god nor gave thanks to him so what is creation? What is the story that God has set up for us actually um, inspiring us to do or actually wanting to lead us into two things, worship and gratitude? And when you watch people and how they often, you know, are actually gung-ho about a certain thing, whether it's their hobbies, or a certain type of artist or, or, or a musician, you know, and they have all the albums. I remember my my brother was very much into ACDC when he was a teenager. My mother was horrified because there was these posters all over his bedroom. But, you know, that's what he was worshipping in a sense at the time. Idolizing these singers and instrumentalists and the way they dressed and the way they painted their faces and all of that and you would know all the songs same with sports right <laughs> i come from a country where soccer truly rules you know the stadiums not now but before the pandemic they were full and people were so you know, into their teams that, you know, often there would be brawls afterwards, you know, if the own team lost or there were some fans from the other team visiting, you know, and they were so into it, you know, and into winning that, you know, nothing else counted. And, you know, if the team won, well, now we could live another week. <laughs> it's crazy, right? But that just shows you there is a drive within us to worship. And so what I want to leave you here this morning is two things, you know, allow that impulse to worship, to worship the true God, to live consciously in the true story. Because God is beautiful. God is wonderful towards us and not just towards us, but towards all his creation. We saw in the past that includes even invisible beings like angels, and it includes the animal world as well. God cares. And gratitude is the proper response. When we're really conscious of what is going on, even you know when things are not perfect, and when we can't come to church in the numbers that we normally want to come to, there's still so much to be thankful for. There's still food on the table. There is still, you know, the other connections we can make. We, we can still make phone calls. We can still, you know, from a distance, at least see each other. When we have our prayer meetings here on Tuesday mornings, you know, at least we do the little elbow bump. And whatever is possible. We've not forgotten each other. We're still gifts towards one another. 
And God certainly is just as present here as he always was before. So that's what I wanted to uh, share with you from my side. And now I'll invite Jesse up to talk about the whole thing from a little bit of a different angle. And then after him, we'll have uh, Kelvin join us and then we'll have a short little panel discussion. What I really liked about that uh, is where you ended uh, <coughs> gives so generously to us uh, and a really large uh, point in my spiritual formation recently has been this realization that every moment is a moment where God gifts himself and creation to us. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about how every moment is a story. Famous author once said, if you build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them work tasks, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. What often fills us with vigor and life as human beings is the stories that we live inside. Stories make us who we are. And so being aware of the story that we live in is a very, very important matter. I spend a little bit of time at the gym and whenever I'm there, I see one story in particular playing out over and over again. I see people telling themselves a story that their body is shameful. And as I see people live out this story, I see it enacted in some really painful ways. I see people torture themselves. I see people injure themselves. And sometimes I even see people chemically enhance themselves. Very often I see people who are grotesquely muscular or so thin that their bones have begun to press through their clothes. So the stories that these people have been telling themselves have gone so far and are so powerful that they've actually shaped the bodies of the people who are living inside of them. Stories are powerful. They can transform our bodies like witchcraft and transmute our desires like alchemy. The stories are much more pervasive than what happens to us as a whole. Uh, stories invade every single moment of our lives. They animate us moment by moment. They reach into a moment and shape it like a potter is shaping clay. And over time, these moments build up until we can see how the story shaped us. But the actual work of these stories happens moment by moment. I once wanted to be good at construction. I thought that if I could learn a trade, it would give me a source of income between pastoring jobs. And I could also help people out with, with this really practical skill. It would be really useful. So I started taking construction jobs when I was 14. And uh, every summer I would work construction. And I worked really hard because I really wanted to learn the skills. But I also knew nothing about construction. <laughs> and so I was a very bad construction worker. And my bosses and coworkers would occasionally yell at me for throwing the board up backwards or not being able to carry the weight. And as I began to internalize this yelling and this anxiety that I felt in the workplace, I started to develop this story um, that I call Jesse is a bad craftsman. My work days were slowly filled up with anxiety by the story and I shut down. I wasn't able to focus on my work because I was so focused on this story. I'm bad at this. I'm gonna screw up, I'm gonna screw up, don't screw up. And so much of my mental energy went into this story that I couldn't do my work properly. I put boards up backwards because I was consumed by this story. And so I checked out of my construction job long before I left the work site. 
which is actually, which is really dangerous on a construction site for the record. To this day, I'm, anxious, I'm an anxious wreck whenever I see someone just step onto a work site. One author in particular has helped me understand this phenomenon. He writes, stories are a mean of emotional, means of emotional pre-focusing. It shapes our underlying take on the world, and they do so because a narrative operates on an emotional register, what some call anti-predictive know-how, a knowing without thinking that is processed in the body. So basically, your body keeps sore, keeps, keeps track of, of these, these stories. And these stories work their way into your bones and they shape you. So I've given you an example of how a bad story shaped me. I also want to give a story about how a good story shaped me. When I wasn't doing construction during the summers, I was attending Firecrest. While I was there, I was swept up into this community of men who just loved Jesus. While I was there, I was in a particular dorm called Eliason Manor, and, and, and this community was, was tremendous for me. Uh, it became my home, and we broke bread, and we drank wine, communion wine. <laughs> Drinking was actually against <laughs> <the purpose. laughs> but we had communion together, and we confessed without any kind of fear of, of being exposed. We worshiped God. As I participated in this community, a story about who I am and who Jesus was began to work its way into my bones. Only this, this story said, remember me. And we did. We remembered Jesus through all our acts of quiet, brotherly love. It was in this place that my identity shifted most clearly to being a child of God because that, that was the story that I lived in. I think oftentimes Christians talk about find your identity in God, keep your identity in Christ. What that most clearly means to me is to inhabit the story of Jesus, be a part of the story of Jesus. So, I was fired from my last construction job because I was so darn mad at it. But I was okay with that because God was present even as I was fired. My body shook, but my soul rested in him. What I want to point out here is that I myself was largely tangential to what happened in these places. I wasn't, I wasn't the one telling the story to myself most of the time. The story was told to me, and I accepted it without prejudice, whether it was your bad carpentry or the story of Jesus. I think the deeper that our roots grow into a story, the easier it becomes to understand when you're being told something different. And this is one reason that, that faithful Christians that have followed Jesus for many years are so valuable to us as a congregation. If you've been living the Christian story for long enough, it's worked its way inside of you. And it's, it's kind of like that German accent that you just can't shape. It's, it's a part of you. But as we struggle to believe the good news of Jesus is our main story, it helps us to pay attention to it. Um, and it, it can be difficult at times. There will be times when we believe a different story and the story of Jesus. There will be times that we believe we're not enough. We're not good enough for whatever reason to do whatever. And these stories come up and challenge the story of Jesus. That Jesus has been good enough and is good enough and that we belong in him, with him, as part of his family. And so if we pay attention to the story that God's telling in, in the different settings we find ourselves, we actually open ourselves up to hearing a new story. The wood that we cut and shape is wood given to us by God to fashion into something useful for others to enjoy and for the glory of God. The pharmaceuticals that we dispense are the graces of God for people suffering anxiety, and depression, and illness. The programs and the lessons we craft 
or ultimately a story that will shape the lives and experiences of the adults and children who participate. The moments with our family, all those intimate moments, the moment where one of us turns to the other and says, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Or the moment where you wake up and there's a warm coffee on the counter. These are all moments, not just of what's right there in front of you, but also of God being right there in front of you, of him working in all these things, present, offering his grace and love to you. However, we're humans. It's all too easy to forget the mundane moments of work and play that God is present in. It's easy to have our hearts recruited by the world's stories, or worse, the devil's stories. To this, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus doesn't come to give us stuff to do, to drain our attention at every moment, to, to make us focus on him all the time. He doesn't come to, to demand that of us and to make us feel guilty when we, when we forget the story that is supposed to be the most important story that we have. As we struggle to live the story of King Jesus, he's also present with us in his body, the church. He's given us one another to tell the story to each other. That's why we gather here and we sing. We sing the story of Jesus, not just to God, but to each other. We remind each other who we are and who God is. This is why we preach. We go through the story over and over again. This is who Jesus is. This is who you are in light of him. This is why we break communion bread together and drink the wine, to remember that God in the flesh was broken for us. We tell the story to each other because very often we fail to tell it to ourselves. I need that. And you need that. We all need that. That's why we're here. We're watching online. We are here to remember this story over and over until it gets into our bones and we live the story. That brings us to Kelvin. She's going to talk to us about sharing that story. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, I'm going to be talking to you guys about sharing the story. And sharing the story is one of those things that um, is a difficult thing to do. And I, when I left, last left you with my message, I asked, what is your story? Because everyone has a story to tell. And telling the story means that we have to become vulnerable. We have to be willing to share what is going on in our lives. And that's a difficult thing because we want to have this picture that we're perfect, that there's nothing wrong with us. And yet we all need help. We all need Jesus to help us. And so we need to be sharing that. But it's a scary thing. And I, I'll admit there's been times where I have been afraid or scared to share what's going on in my life. Because what, what, what would you think of me as a leader sharing this and saying, hey, I have a struggle with this, or I struggle with this. Why should I be up here because I'm that, uh, because I struggle with this? And it's difficult to do, right? It's not easy to share some of these deeper things, and we need to be comfortable with that. But I have three things that I want to share with that. Um, as we go through and as we share, um, we need to be bold in that. We need to be saying, you want to know what? This is who I am. And I'm not scared to share that. I'm not scared to um, say that this is what I've gone through. 
being bold is one of those things that um, says we stand up for what we believe in, and we're not going to change that. This week I had um, an opportunity on Wednesday. I, well, it, God gave me the opportunity. I felt the need to pray for someone uh, very strongly. And so I spent some time praying for this individual. And then later in the week, I talked to them and I said, you want to know what? I, I felt the need to pray for you on this day. Um, that individual went through and shared with me that how uh, they were having trouble at work on that day. And so here was an opportunity to share that, uh, you know, what was going on in their life and how that had made a difference. And so, you know, there's opportunities that God gives us to pray for individuals and to um, do these things. And it's not, um, it's for us to take that opportunity to be able to share that. And, you know, he will prompt us in many different ways. Do we have the courage to share that? Do we have the courage to say, hey, I felt God leading me to pray for you. What's going on in your life? Or are we going to say, you want to know what? Your life is your life and my life is my life. We're in a family here together. And we should have that ability and that comfortability to be able to share together what's going on in our struggles. The other thing is, you know, when it comes to sharing, we don't have to be... Uh, seminary um, masters or doctors or any of that. Um, when you look at the disciples, especially, let's take two um, out, uh, Peter and John, they were fishermen. They, 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 that was their livelihood before Jesus called them into ministry. They didn't have a degree. They didn't serve in the temple. They didn't have anything, but yet they were um, there. And when they preached, People were amazed. If you look at um, Acts 14, verse 13, they say, And the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Peter and John were able to stand up and declare the message. And people recognized them and um, understood where they were coming from and that they had authority with this. And they were living the story. They were part of that. And so here, we can do the same thing. We can um, share what has been going on. Which brings me to my third point. What has God done for you? How has God been working in your life? And what has he done? How has he shown his power to you? How has he been faithful in your prayer requests and in your life. And then to be able to share that and encourage others is that influence. Um, like I said earlier, sharing can be scary, but as we rely on Jesus, as we rely on the Holy Spirit, uh, he will help give us the words. He will help give us uh, the situations where we can uh, help others, where we can encourage them, and we can join in their story and relying on and uh, they can help us as well in our faith and uh, as we come together we can share being a storyteller for jesus not only touches people who need him but brings joy and strength to the storyteller themselves so again i will end with this what is your story because everyone has a story to tell Thank you, Calvin and Jesse. Uh, now we give you an opportunity to give us feedback, or maybe some questions have arisen as you've listened to you know, us talk about various aspects of God's story and how it plays out in our lives. Uh, maybe you even have an objection. You know, this is uh, another good thing uh, that we see in the New Testament that in the church there's interaction with each other. And sometimes uh, we need to wrestle with some topics and issues and find the answer together rather than have it preached down to us. So there is uh, particularly Paul's comment on weighing prophecy. Prophecy not just as foretelling the future, but really what is God's word to us? So I don't know if there are any questions here, so just feel free. Uh, to stand up and hopefully uh, we can hear you well enough. 
Um, normally, I'd also give people at home an, an opportunity to text in, but uh, we don't have all that set up yet. Yes, we do. Maybe so, well, we do. Okay. Oh, if you're on uh, YouTube, you can write in the comments. I just uh, posted that there. So, yep. Okay, so if you have a question at home, I'll put it on onto the YouTube feed and I'll tell them what we did after this. Any question, comment? Um, about being bold, because this morning, um, before coming to church, I was reading in the book of Joshua, and in the first chapter, where um, Joshua has to take over now with Moses, and interestingly, in that first chapter, Joshua is told three times, be courageous and bold. Um, and, and considering the, the Responsibility that he was about to take on. But but God told me twice, and then later on, some of the people of Israel also told me to be praised. So, yes, a good, good message. Yeah. Yeah, just to repeat that very quickly, uh, for those who couldn't hear that at home, uh, Alan just shared uh, from Joshua how Joshua was encouraged three times to be bold and courageous and how. Uh, that really resonated with him, you know, in the call for us and sharing uh, our testimony, you know, or, or things God is doing in our lives. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, Simon? Uh, you often talk about the stories that we tell each other and how stories have and have huge consequences on yourself. So how do you deal with a bad story that you've been dealing or that you've been telling yourself and it's sort of just so deeply rooted in, well, inside yourself? Can I, can I take that one? Yeah. Um, Let's just repeat this question first. So the question is, how do you deal with a bad story that you've been telling yourself that seems really deeply rooted? Or maybe you're not even telling it to yourself. Maybe it's something that you were told a lot as a young child, and it's just like rooted itself in you, and it, it's it's feeling impossible to get rid of. Um, one of my favorite theologians talks about the Godfather problem when it comes to stories like this. So, in the Godfather, you have this main character who um, is Catholic. He goes to a Catholic church. He participates in Catholic rituals, and and he really gets this story of Jesus worked into him by a lot of these these rituals. And, and the question comes up, well, he's participating in these stories, and yet he also goes out and kills people. Um, how is it that um, we as a church can resist the stories of our culture when the stories that are embedded in us uh, by, by the church seem so weak by comparison? Um, I don't want to pretend that Culture isn't telling us powerful stories, that we're not telling ourselves stories that are really, really um, difficult to deal with. I think that's reality. Um, these are powerful things. At the same time, I think that if we name those stories and we confess those stories to one another, we tell them to each other, you know, I, I believe this. Oh my gosh. Um, what do I do with that? Uh, and you, you bring that to your, your church family, you actually give them the opportunity to tell you a different story. Um, I have a friend who frequently hears the story of, you're not welcome, you don't belong. And, and whenever I hear him telling that story to himself, I, I'm just overwhelmed with this compassion to tell him, no, you're loved, you belong uh, in, in church and, and you belong as my friend. And, and, and your character. And I think I think uh, having the, the openness to talk about the stories we tell to ourselves and are being told, uh, it allows us to be a part of the church in a much more robust way that, that lets the story speak to us and transform us. And, and actually, to go back to what Kelvin said, when we 
when we are open about the stories that we tell ourselves or are being told that aren't the gospel, it allows the church to preach the gospel to us and to reach those really, really hard places and to belong in any way. So that, that would be my encouragement uh, is, is to be open about those stories and to talk about them. Um, yeah, because the church is, is a hospital for sick people, not a place for all the healthy people to gather. Does that answer your question or do you want to go deeper? If I can just add on to that, um, it's not easy to um, empty a lie of its of its power, right? When, when you do it, but one thing we can do is both not dwell on maybe what other people are saying, or you know, <laughs> listening to what pulls us down, but deliberately making space for the truth. You know, when it talks in Colossians about you know, continually, um, you know, speaking in psalms to one another and, and being filled with the word of God, you know, that, that can be both in your personal Bible reading and maybe even memorizing some of those key verses, but also the music, you know. Uh, uh, Jesse mentioned that earlier, you know, when, when we sing hymns of words, it's not just singing to God, it's singing to one another. And that in itself, you know, is a re- affirming of what is true about us. So when our worship team sings, you say who, you say who I am, uh, what was the actual one? <laughs> I am who you say I am, right? So it's not, you know, that person who, you know, really has this totally negative image of me and, you know, always points out the, the faults and the shortcomings. Uh, my identity is not in that. It's not in the condemnation. It, it, it's not in, you know, what kind of reputation I have in front of others. It, it's who God says I am. And what does God say in the word? You are my beloved. You are my child. You are worthy. Uh, I died for you. And you are secure in me. I will never let you go. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And to continually hear that. You know, whether it's in word or in song, I think that in itself has that power to really <laughs> counteract the negative. Uh, we have time for one more. Is there anyone else? Well, thank you very much. Um, I can answer the question. Yeah. Oh, sure. How's it okay. you still? <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, I'll invite Alan up so that we can see our final hand. Our last hymn is called One Day.
suffering anguish, rejected here on our sins by redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, Mary he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever, one day is coming, a glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glory will shine. Wonderful day my beloved will spring. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Greeting he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day his me, all glory has Let's now stand for the benediction. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Wish you all a blessed Sunday. Have a good one, man.